There are over 200,000 around here. Did you hear what I said? Two, over 200,000 people around this area that need the Lord. Over 200,000 just in this area. It's amazing. I was thinking as they were singing that song of that, of that young man, Brother Kerry, and I met yesterday. Really sad. Brother Kerry knocked on the door and introduced us. And the guy said, I'm not, said something like this. I'm not interested. Brother Kerry said, we're here to tell you about, about Jesus Christ and eternal life. And he said, I don't care. And closed the door. And that's that. Young man, probably. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm guessing Caleb's age, probably. Young man. Probably about that age. I don't care. He needs the Lord. Really bad. He doesn't even know it. He doesn't even care. It's really sad. But uh, we need to go out and find people that that do care and want to know. And there are people like that. So that's who we're, that's what we want to find. Amen. First Peter chapter 5. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for sending someone to me to tell me about Jesus. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for giving me the Bible <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit as my teacher of your perfect word. Help me now to listen to listen as you guide me through this. Help me to say the right words. Help all of us to focus in on what you're going to say through the word of God, through God's man today. And then the Lord help us to be obedient to what you say, uh, to not be disobedient to what you're going to tell us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was reading verse 10 in 1 Peter chapter 5 one day. I thought about what a great life that would be, to have that kind of a life. <clears throat> Where God said here, uh, the Bible says in verse 10, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Wouldn't that be a great life? Be like that? Uh, that'd, that'd be amazing. Now this means, uh, uh, he says here first of all, to be a perfect Christian. Now, I know there's nobody perfect. No Christian is perfect. But this is what it means. The word perfect there means to be complete, thoroughly, by the process of, of being repaired and adjusted. That's what that means. To be perfect or, th or to completely thorough, be made complete, completely thorough by the process of being repaired and adjusted. That's what we're in the process of, by the way. God is repairing us and adjusting us. That's what he's doing in our life. I mean, I don't know about you, but I need a lot of repairing, and I definitely need a lot of adjusting. And God is doing that in my life, and I'm thankful for that. Then to be an established Christian means to be set fast or steadfastly set. It means to turn resolutely in a certain direction. Then he said, I'll make you strong. To be a strong Christian, this means to be confirmed in spiritual knowledge and power. And then he says, <coughs> to be a settled Christian. This means to be put down in one place like a foundation to get comfortable with. Not open for discussion or debate anymore. It's all settled. That's what that means. And this is what God is trying to make us into. This is what God has for us in our Christian life. <clears throat> um, this verse teaches that God does this in our life in response to how we conduct our daily life ourselves. And in this chapter, chapter 5 of 1 Peter, the Lord is talking to pastors and lay people and tells uh, us how the Christian life works. We give to God our obedience to these things, and he gives to us his full attention to the details of our life. So he can, so he can repair us and adjust us. <clears throat> this is how we can live a simple, stable, useful life each day. We are, we are on this earth until we get to heaven. Now, this is what God wants for us. And I just want to say this this morning. The Christian life works. Okay? If you work it, the Christian life works. It really does. And if you'll work it the way you're supposed to, then God will give you what 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 is talking about. <clears throat> now, there's nothing spooky about the Christian life. There's nothing hard about the Christian life. I don't care what anybody says. You can say, well, the Christian life is hard. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not hard at all. It's not hard. We make it hard. It's not hard. Boy, if you just see how God lays it all out in the Bible and, and how to do these things, I mean, it's not hard. Compare that to what, what the world, what the way you were living before you got saved. Compare that to that kind of life. My goodness, the Christian life is not hard at all. <clears throat> um, the, so if you listen carefully to what I'm going to talk about this morning, you'll see how good and how simple God wants our lives to be. 
and what he will do for us if we if we live a real Christian life. So if you're real with God, I'm going to show you this morning how simple your life can be and how good your life can be because the Christian life works. He came to give us life and he may give it to us more abundantly. I'm telling you, this lifestyle works. Now, we can stand up here, several of us can stand up here, have lived it for a while, for, for decades, decades. And by the way, my, my college president said, you don't measure Christianity in years, you measure it in decades. And, and I'm telling you, I've been doing it for almost, it's going on four decades now, and I'm telling you, it works. This life works. It really, truly works. If you'll work it, it'll work. Now, let me tell you what, let me tell you about, about this passage we read in First Peter chapter 5. By the way, God has every right to expect this out of us because we're Christians. We don't belong to Satan anymore. So these things I'm going to talk to you about this morning, God has every right to expect this out of us because we are Christians. I mean, <clears throat> I don't, I shouldn't be living like I belong to Satan anymore because I don't. Right, right. You shouldn't either. Some of you Christians are living like you still belong to Him. I'm not saying you bow down and, and go to, to to black masses or you you have a satanic Bible. But I'll tell you what, in a lot of if you're if you're not doing it God's way, you got a satanic life. And why why are you living like why are you serving someone that you don't belong to anymore? You belong to God. You're his child. Live like like you like you do belong to him. Our citizenship is no longer here on this earth. God says our citizenship is in heaven, so why do we live like our citizenship is still here on earth? God said in Colossians 3, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Why? Because our citizenship is up there, and we ought to be falling in love with that place, not this place. Right. <clears throat> so many of us live like we still belong to the enemy. So many of us live like we still our citizenship is still here on this earth. So God has every right, though, to expect what I'm going to talk about out of you. All right, and, you, and don't say you can't do it because you can. You can. It's easy. It's easy with with it, when God's leading the way. <clears throat> things it's just not hard. It's just not hard. Now, let me tell. First of all, in this passage, he's talking to the pastors and the elders in verses one through four, and these are the leaders in the church. These are the more more experienced, older believers. And so he says here, he talks about how uh, he talks about witnessing of the sufferings of Christ. He said, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and, wit and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. <clears throat> so he was, as were many of the other leaders in the first churches, he, they were witnesses of the sufferings of Christ. They saw his sufferings. They saw what he went through. They saw the things that, that he had to take. And, uh, and so um, they're, they want, they're given an assignment by God, as we heard in Sunday school, to tell people what Jesus went through and why. <clears throat> why did he go through what he went through? Why did Jesus go to the cross? Why did he suffer all he had to suffer? Why did he take the, the, the 39 uh, lashes on his, on his body? Why did he have his beard pulled out? Why did, he have, why did he take spit on his face from human beings, spitting in his face, or hitting him in the face, or hitting him over the head with a stick? Why did he take all that? Why did he let people... Walk, uh, give him a cross to make him walk up a hill. And why they shove the, why they nail him to that cross and nail his hand, his hands and his feet to the cross. And why they shove the cross into the hole, let him hang there until he died. Why? Because he loves us. Right. Why did that happen? Because he loves us. That's why. That's why the sufferings of Christ. <laughs> he talks here in verse number one about being partaker of his glory, being partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Um, we can live a life in such a way that you will share in the time when Christians will glorify God in heaven and God will glorify us. We can, we can be partakers of the glory of God. We can be a sharer or a partner or a companion of the glory of God. By the way, the worldly Christian does not want to glorify God, and neither will God want to glorify them now or later. But he wants us, he tells the elders, he said, I want you to be partakers of the glory that, of God. He said, I want you to, to uh, <clears throat> glorify God in heaven and glorify God here down on earth and be partakers of and a companion of and a share of that glory. Then he says, feed the flock of God. 
He tells the elders to feed the flock of God. And that's exactly what a Christian, what a pastor is supposed to do, what a preacher of God's word is supposed to do. Well, an older Christian is supposed to do too. They're supposed to feed people the word of God. You know, you ought not to be getting older as a Christian and not be teaching somebody the word of God. That's right. You should be doing that. But but when you're gonna when you're gonna tell people when you're, when you're as you're growing older in the Christian faith, you need to make sure that you are feeding the flock of God. A pastor needs to make sure he's feeding the people. A pastor shouldn't stand up here and tell a bunch of funny stories and give little these little simple little illustrations and not give out the word of God. He's supposed to feed the flock of God with the word of God. That's what he's supposed to do. <clears throat> he's also he also tells them to be examples to the flock to be examples of the believer, to be an example of how to suffer, just the whole Christian life. The elder people, the older Christians, the pastors, and the older Christians are supposed to be examples of what the Christian life's all about. Well, I'll tell you, I would love to see my grandchildren one day say <clears throat> about me, uh, Grandpa showed me how to live the Christian life. I'd like to, one day, uh, if you say anything about me after I, after I die off, if you say anything about me, I'd like, one of the things I'd like you to say about me is he showed us how to live the Christian life. Not just taught us how to do it, but showed us too. He tried to live what he preached. No one could do it perfectly, but he tried to live what he preached. He was an example to the flock, and that's exactly what we're supposed to do. He tells that to the leaders of the church. Be a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Be a partaker of the glory of the Lord, and also feed the flock of God and be an example to the flock. But then I want you to notice after that, down to verse number 5. <laughs> verse number 5, he says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. He tells the younger Christians, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty head of God, and may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He tells them, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren there in the world. So he's showing them, this is what I want you to do, you younger Christians. Of course, the older ones are supposed to teach them this, and the older ones are supposed to be examples of this. But all of us are supposed to do what he's telling us to do here in these next few verses. He First of all, he says in verse 5, be subject one to another. Be subject one to another. Give others their own way and serve others. Be subject one to another. Hey, you other Christians, don't, don't lord over people. Don't, don't look for a leadership position. Look to be someone who can be subject one to another. Be subject Amen. to your authority. Be subject to each other, the Bible says, Ephesians 5.21, submit yourself one to another. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to look to be the boss. We're supposed to look to be the servant. We're not supposed to look to have other people meet our needs. We're supposed to look to meet their needs. We're not to look to have our own way. We're looking to, to help other people uh, get what, what they need to get for the Lord. Give others their own way. Serve them. Don't be selfish. Be subject one to another. That's what God wants us to do. See, there won't be any problem with, oh, he's not treating me right, or I'm not getting to, to sing the song I want to sing, or I'm not getting to do what I want to do if everybody would just do this. Be subject one to another. If everybody followed this particular verse right here, there would be no, no thing, no, nothing in the church that would go undone. I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve. This is what I'm here to do. I, I've told this story before when I when I was a young Christian and I and I wanted to I really wanted to get into to doing things in the church and so I was doing some things I was uh, cleaning a little bit and stuff like that but I wanted to do more in fact I wanted to get I wanted to be a I wanted to be a, 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 a in, into the ministry more than I was like almost full time in the ministry so while I'm standing there and I'm t standing with this guy in the hallway of our church and my and this is what I'm doing this is how dumb I was <clears throat> I was watching the pastor mop the floor. Now, he's been around, he was at that time, pastoring for 35, 40 years. <clears throat> and he's mopping the floor, and I'm standing there. There's a 23-year-old man watching him mop the floor. And this other guy about my age is standing there, too. And so he says to the pastor, he says, I want to get in the ministry. What do I have to do to get in the ministry? You know what he's thinking of? He's thinking of getting behind the pulpit. I want to get behind the pulpit, and I want to preach great sermons, and I want to build a great church, and I want to be famous. And everybody look at me and say, he's the pastor. That's what he was thinking, by the way he asked him. So he's standing there, he asked the pastor that question, is the pastor's mouth on the floor? So he asks this, what do I need to do to get in the ministry? And so the pastor stops, he thinks for a second, 
and he hands him a mop and he says, here. Amen. Can I tell you, the guy didn't take the mop. I took the mop. I said, oh, really? Okay, that's what I'll do. So I took the mop, and, and so I started cleaning the floors, and I started do- cleaning the toilets, and I started replacing the toilet paper, and I started cleaning the windows, and I started washing the windows and painting the building and, and, and building a, a chain-link fence that I'd never built before in my life. You should see how it looks right now. I wish you could go there and see it. It's still there, I think. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> it's the most terrible <laughs> chain-link fence that was ever put up in the history of the world. But I did it because he said, you want to get in the ministry? Here. Because the ministry is about serving. That's right. See, it's about being subject one to another. It's not about trying to get over somebody, trying to be ahead of somebody, trying to be a leader. It's about being subject one to another. <clears throat> Submit yourself to the authority that God has given you. Submit uh, the church, the authority in the church. Submit yourself to each other, other fellow church members. Submit yourself to doing God's will for your life. Submit yourself to God. Uh, James chapter 4. And verse 7, James chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible says here, um, James 4 verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. So the Bible tells us, submit ourselves, submit ourselves, put ourselves under the authority, put ourselves under each other. I'm not here over you, I'm here to serve you. And by the way, it doesn't matter that I've been saved longer than most of you have been saved. It doesn't matter that I've been in the ministry all these years and I went to Bible college and all that stuff. That doesn't matter. God said, you're a servant, serve. And then he says, submit yourself to God to do God's will for your life. Boy, you know what? If all of us could be like Mary, the mother of Jesus. Wow, what what an amazing, amazing woman. She says, this is how she answered it when God challenged her. I want, here's what I want for your life. Here's what I want. This is my will for your life. The messenger, the angel was sent to tell her that from God. And she said, be it unto me according to thy word. If you would just say that, Christian, be it unto me according to thy word. Maybe God's never come to you and showed you what he wanted you to do with, with your life. He will. He will. If you want him to, he will. But see, you know what he's looking for? He's not looking for somebody to say, well, I wasn't expecting you to tell me to do that. I was expecting all this glamorous stuff. Be in the limelight. Have everybody see what I'm doing so I can get all these compliments and being bragged on. I've known people who got upset because there maybe a list of people uh, helped uh, do a certain project and the pastor read off the list saying, thank you, the so-and-so, and he forgot their name. And they got mad about that. Can you imagine getting mad because a pastor forgot to mention that you were part of the team that did the project? That is so childish. That's not fulfilling this verse at all. That's not being subject to one. That's not looking to be a servant of God and a servant to others and a servant to your authority. That's looking for, I'm doing this because I want a pat on the back, because I want to be recognized, because I want everybody to know that I did all this stuff. In fact, he even says this in the next line. He said, likewise, you younger subject, submit yourselves unto the others, unto the elder. Yeah, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Look at that. Be clothed. You want the Christian life to work? Submit yourself to, to other people. And he, one to another, that means all of you, all of us. And then <clears throat> submit yourself to your authority, submit yourself to God, and then be clothed with humility. That means to wear humility. To show a meek and a quiet spirit. It's a requirement, by the way, to have a walk with God. Do you know that? Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, if you'll go there, Micah chapter 6, verse 8, be clothed with humility. Now, you've got to ask yourself as as I'm preaching this this morning, first of all, are you subject one to another? Are you sub- have you subjected yourself to God's authority in your life, to God's will for your life? Have you subjected yourself to each other, to be a servant to each other? Have you subjected yourself to the authority that God has put in your life, the spiritual authority? And then Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, it says, He has showed the old man what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. 
So God says, you want to walk with me, you've got to walk humbly with me. It's very important. You've got to walk humbly. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. The Bible says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. You need to put other people before you. Humble yourself and serve others. It goes along with what he said in the first part of the verse. Humble yourself. Let me give you a couple of examples here. Luke chapter 14 and verse 10. Luke chapter 14, verse 10. <clears throat> the Bible says here, um, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. Then when the, he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. So humble yourself. Don't try to sit in the highest place. Don't try to go for the highest position. No, sit back. Humble yourself. Get behind everybody else. And then Proverbs chapter 22, I'm sorry, Luke 22, verse uh, 26, it says here, Luke 22, verse 26, it says, But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and as he that is chief, as he that does serve. That's all part of humility. I'm here to serve you. What can I do for you? My needs are last. You come before me. That's the way we're supposed to be. You see, you want the Christian life to work, you got to subject yourself one to another. You got to be clothed with humility. You got to be clothed with it. It, it. Really, it really shouldn't be that hard to, if you read the Bible carefully and see what God says about you without Him, it shouldn't be hard. It's hard to be proud, when, unless you're a person that lives, doesn't live in reality. If you live in this dream world, Maybe you can pat yourself on the back and say, you know what, I am, I am so I am really good at stuff. I'm really good at this. I'm really good. I'm I'm a I'm a good father. I'm a I'm a good husband. I'm a good uh, church member. <clears throat> why don't you why don't you look at what you are without God? If you look at what you are without God, what the Bible says, then you realize that anything you ever have become is because of God. Right. So who gets the credit? Shouldn't be you. It's God. Okay. Because he did it all. Paul said it, the, one of the greatest Christians ever lived, he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He didn't say, I am what I am because I because I, I do what I'm told. I am what I am because I went to school and I learned all this stuff. I have all this knowledge. I am what I am because of all the effort I put into it. No, I am what I am by the grace of God. It's real simple. Be clothed with humility. Then he says in verse 7, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. <clears throat> This is why we are not allowed to, to care or be anxious or worry. Cast all your care upon him. As you're going through your life and you're living for him and you're serving others <clears throat> and you keep yourself humble before God, realizing what you are without him. Right. Cast all your care. As life brings its cares, cast it on him. Go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. You want the Christian life to work? Cast your care upon him. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So he said, be careful or be anxious or don't care for anything. Don't be full of care for anything. He said, cast it on God. Go to prayer and cast it on God. Now, I want you to see some here. Matt, when you think about the cares of your life and think about your problems that you have and the hard times you go through, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31, the Bible says here, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, I want you to hear this. For your heavenly Father, if you're saved, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. He knows exactly what you need. He knows all about you. The Bible even says in one place, he knows the very hairs, number of hairs on your head. He knows all about you. He knows all about your cares. Don't leave him out of it. He's already taken enough interest, personal interest in you to watch you, to know exactly what you're going through. So when you're going through a care, the Bible says, cast it on him and pray. Not only throw it on him, but ask him for help too. Go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 7. If you don't do this, if you take all these worries upon yourself, <clears throat> this is what's going to happen. Matthew 13, verse 7. <clears throat> I'm going to read verse 7, then I'm going to go to verse 22. 
And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. So he's telling the parable of the seed, okay? And he says about some seed, it fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now here, verse 22 tells you what he means. He says, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. So he hears the word of God, all right? And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So what God says is the care of this world, the worries of this world will choke the word. See, if you, you don't do what God says when he said, be careful for nothing or don't worry about anything. If you decide to worry and it's your decision and you face, a, you face a, a care in your life, you can either worry about it or not. It's up to you. God says you have really good, good, good reason not to worry. The devil says you really have a good reason to worry. You have your choice, What you're going to, who you're going to listen to. It's your choice, right? But he says, if you uh, uh, care, hold on to the cares of this world, it's going to choke the word in your life. See, you just say, you make up your mind. You come in this room this morning, you've got some problems, you've got some heartaches, you've got some burdens, and you're really, you're stuck in them. I mean, you're to, it's, it's changed your attitude. It's caused you to get mad. It's caused you to get bitter. I mean, your attitude stinks. And so you hear the word of God, and God can't get through to you because the cares have choked it. Here comes God with the help. Here comes God with the answer. Here comes God with an offer of his love and understanding and his listening ear and his power to help. But it doesn't get through to you as it gets to your heart. It's choked because you've decided, I'm going to worry. That's right. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to let this situation in my life rule my life. It's going to control my thinking. It's going to control my attitude. And God says, you know, when I try to help you with the word of God, the word of God's going to be choked. So you go to church and you say, well, I heard the preacher preach that and it didn't help me out. Well, it was supposed to, and it would have if you opened your heart to the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> he says, he tells us here, cast, I just tell you folks, the Christian life works. Right. And you make it work. By subjecting yourself what, to your authority and to each other and to God. You make it work by wearing humility, not pride. Don't allow pride to come into your life. Wear humility, be clothed with humility, and cast all your care upon him. Cast all your care upon him. But the problem is, we believe the worry more than what God's word says. There's more to life than the things you are worried about. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is what God said. Just listen to God's word. Matthew 6, verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, or nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment, which is clothing? Isn't your life more than that? There's more to life than the things you're worried about. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34, Luke chapter 21 and verse 34 the Bible says, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with serpenting and drunkenness and cares of this life. So that day come upon you unawares. You're not going to be ready for a second coming if you let the cares of this life control you. We are to cast it on him. We cast it on him by getting alone with him and talking to him about it and then praying. First, you share your burden. Lord, this is how I feel. This is what's going on in my heart. These are my fears. These are my concerns. And then you pray. You say, Lord, could you help me? Could you help me work this out? Could you do this thing I need you to do? Would you please do this? Cast all your care upon him. And then the rest of that verse says what? For he careth for you. What a promise. What an amazing promise that is. You see? <clears throat> First pray and then trust him. Let me just give you some verses here. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, Exodus 19.4, Deuteronomy 33.27, Psalm 18.35, Psalm 91.11 and 12, Isaiah 41.10, Isaiah 46.4. Right, these verses, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them that tell me I don't have any need to worry at all. How can you not? Just, man, just get in the word of God. Let God speak to you. Cast your care upon him. Get in the word of God. See his promises. And you can't help but read this Bible and, and close it and say, God doesn't want me to worry. There's no reason to worry. You see, <clears throat> well, some of you say, well, I've tried living a Christian life, but it doesn't work. Yeah, it does. If you work it, it'll work. That's right. See, cast all your care upon him. Then he says in verse 8, he tells us, be sober. 
Be sober. That means to be discreet or to watch. It just means uh, be safe, sound, self-controlled. Keep focused on what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Be serious about it. <clears throat> be focused on the purpose that God has showed you for your life. By the way, if you're in Sunday school this morning, you heard your purpose. Be focused on what really matters. And don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Get serious about the Christian life and God's plan for your life. Be sober. That's what it means. Be discreet. Watch. Be self-controlled. Be sound. Be safe. Be serious about what God has for you. You see, okay, so a long time ago, I was, I was, I was presented this, this idea, this thought as a very young Christian. The goal is to get to the end of your life and still be serving God when you die. I like that. And if I do that, and I'm hearing about all the, the blessings that come when you serve God with your life, and you mean I get to have that all the way up to the day I die? That's what I want. You mean I get to meet God like that? That's what I want. You mean if I meet God like that, he'll say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I want to hear those words. That's the goal. That's the goal I've had now for over 35 years. And I'll tell you, what a goal, it's a great goal to have. It's a great purpose to live for, to bring glory and honor to God and to, and to fulfill His great commission. And I'll tell you what, I, as I look through life, as I've seen people live their life, I've seen Christians live their life, and as I read the Word of God, I found out that's all that really matters. That's all that really matters in life is that you do what God put you here to do. Amen. That's all that really matters. God's not going to be impressed with how much money I make. He's not going to be impressed with all the material things I have. He's not going to be impressed with all the worldly things I accomplished. Did I do what I was put here to do? That's all that matters. Amen. That's all that matters. We need to get sober about that. We need to get serious about that. We need to be careful about that. Watch and make sure we're doing that. And don't let anything come into our life that will take us away from that. Then he says, be vigilant. Be vigilant. He says that in verse 8, he's talking about watch for Satan's attempt to get you off track. Watch for Satan's attempt to get you off track. And he will try that many times. You know why the Christian life isn't working for you? Because he's gotten off track. You know why he got you off track? Because you weren't watching. You weren't vigilant. He kind of took it. You kind of took it like, yeah, I've heard that before. Satan's going to attack me. He's not going to. I'll be all right. I'll, I, I can do this. I can make this. I'm okay. <laughs> no, you're not. Because yeah. he's out to get you. He's out to destroy you. That verse we're, we're talking about right now, he's walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know who he can devour? Those that are not vigilant. That's who he's going to devour. You know he's going to devour? Those that are not sober. That's who he's going to devour. You see, and so he says, he says, watch for Satan's attempts. Be on guard. Matthew 26, 41, God talks about being ready. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, 1 Peter 4, 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We are to be, we are to be careful, carefully watching for any attempt to, for Satan to get into our life. Listen, we've got to understand. We've got to know our enemy. We've got to know how tricky he is. We've got to know about his, how, how much of a liar he is, how much of a deceiver he is. We've got to know how much he hates us, how much he hates God, and how much it will bring him happiness and rejoicing if he can see me fall he will be glad he will be laughing he will be excited i don't want him to be able to experience those things and so he'll watch him and his buddies will watch and watch and watch me looking for a hole in my armor how can i get in there how can i get in there some way somehow i'm going to get in there and what you need to do you need to turn around and watch for him trying to get in there that's what he said be vigilant. Then he said, <clears throat> he says, uh, he says, resist, resist him in verse verse eight. Whom resist, <clears throat> be sober, and vigilant, because your adversary, the roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Verse number nine. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Resist him steadfast. That means stand against or oppose him stiffly. That's what it means. Stand against or oppose him stiffly. He will bring you afflictions. In your life. Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give him place. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give him a place or an opportunity in your mind or your life. Don't give him place. 
Why is the Christian life working for me? I'll tell you why. Because somehow, some way, you've given Satan an opportunity to come into your mind and affect your thinking. You've given him an opportunity to come into your life and affect your living. As he said, don't give place to the devil. When Satan tries to sit down, you say, no, just fill your life with God, folks. Fill your life with God. Make it all about God. Christ, who is our life, make it all about God, and Satan won't be able to find a place. I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I can't find a place. So you know what he'll do? He'll do like he did with Jesus. He'll leave for a while. Then he'll come back a little while later and say, I wonder if there's any place now. You know, look and look and look. But I'll tell you what, today, tomorrow, the next day, each day of my life, to the day I go to heaven, I got to make sure my life is all about God. Amen. There's no place for him. I love what James 4 7 says. James 4 7 says this Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee. He'll turn away. That means to turn away or shun or vanish. Now, we know from how he handled Jesus that it'll just be for a season, for a while. He's coming back. But every time he comes back, I want to have the same result. He has to run. He has to get away. He has to flee. There's too much power in that man's life. That's what I want Satan to think when he looks at my life. There's too much power. There's too much God. There's too much holiness. That's what I want him to see in my life. I don't want him to see one little spot in my armor where he can fire a dart at me and try to get me. By the way, you know what? Can I just say this? That's up to me. As much as I have in, of God in my life, it's totally up to me. And I'll tell you what. You're, you're, you're really playing with fire. You're walking <clears throat> dangerous ground when you don't take God and let him fill you, fill your life. That's right. Everything you do revolves around God. Every thought process you have revolves around God. Because he's got control of my life. You see, <clears throat> only one person, when I drive my car, only one person has control of my car. Only one person can control my car at, one, at, the, at, at a time. Only one. And only one person can control my life at a time. It can't be two. See, in fact, you know what God said? If you're trying to share control of your life with anybody, with me and somebody else, he says, I'll step back. And I'll let that other thing or other person in your life that's, that you want to control you, I'll let them control. Because I'm not going to have, it's not, not going to be 99.1% with me. It's not going to be 75% me and 25% that. It's not going to be 50% and 50%. I'm not playing that game. He doesn't do that. He steps back and says, go ahead. You just, whatever that other thing is in your life, they can have you. And when you're ready, when you see this other thing doesn't work, when you see your, your life gets smashed and destroyed because you gave yourself that other thing, then you come and see me. And we'll talk again. <clears throat> and then he says in verse number 9, First Peter, he says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. He's talking here about suffering. There's going to be hardship. There's going to be pain. <laughs> There's going to be uh, all kinds of emotional stresses in your life. That's part of life. It is allowed or sent by God sometimes to test you and strengthen you. Or it is sent by Satan to destroy you. But just remember something. Uh, and, by, and, and one of the reasons why the Christian life isn't working for you is because when you are going through sufferings, you rebel against it. You fight against it. You get mad about it. You don't accept it as being either a test from God or a satanic attack that Satan, that God will help you overcome. You get all upset about it. You, you, get, you react just like Satan wants you to react. You see? But I want you to I want to encourage you with something. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4.17. 2 Corinthians 4.17. Paul, and by the way, think about who wrote this. Paul, of course, the Holy Spirit told Paul to say this, but Paul went through more suffering Boy, it was amazing. There's so many passages that talk about what he went through. The Holy Spirit had him share that with us, all the sufferings he went through. But then he, puts, he writes this verse. For our, what's that? Light 
affliction. Now, we, we get afflicted. We go through something and we go, oh, this is so hard. This is going to kill me. I don't know how I'm going to make it through it. I'll tell you how you're going to make it through it. Capital G, capital O, capital D. That's how you're going to make it through it. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Did you hear that? It's, it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It came to pass. It's not going to stay. It's just for a moment. That's all. You can do it. You can do it with God. God will get you through it. If it was to last the rest of your life, for all, God can get you through no matter how long it takes. But he says it's light and it's just for, you know why it's light? I'll tell you why it's light. Because God's carrying. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what he said. You take a heavy burden and bring it to God, it's no longer heavy if you let him carry it. You just trust him. And he's going to show you this, this thing is this thing's a lot lighter than you thought it was, and it's just for a moment. It's going away. It's not going to stay. See? But we, see, we, we complain about, oh, the Christian life don't work, doesn't work because of all, we're just, all these different things, we don't do it. See, now, <clears throat> if I will do these things, if I will do what he said, subject myself one to another, be clothed with humility, cast all my care upon him, <clears throat> uh, be sober, that's serious about my Christian life, be vigilant, be on guard, resist Satan steadfastly, go through sufferings and take it for what it's supposed to be, let God do the work he wants to do through it then here's what God will do for us. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He will care for you. He will show you he cares. What's really sad is God cares for all of us, but some of us don't know that. We don't realize his care. He cares for you. He'll care for you. He says in verse 4, he says, you'll receive a crown of glory that doesn't fade away. <clears throat> Psalm 84, verse 11, Psalm 84, verse 11, the Bible says this, Psalm 84, verse 11. It says here, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. <clears throat> the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. You will receive a, a crown of glory from the Lord. It doesn't fade away. He will give you grace, verse 5. He will give you grace. He will give you, he will give you an abundance of grace. You'll just see his influence all over your life. Psalm 84, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, 2 Corinthians 1, 12. The Bible says, verse 6, he will exalt us. He will exalt us. He will give us a life of dignity. James chapter 4 and verse 10, he put it like this. He said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. He will exalt us. He will give us a life of dignity. <clears throat> he talks about in Psalms, talks about how the psalmist said, how God lifted me out of the horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock. He took, I'll tell you what, can I just tell you this? I, I have a, I don't have a, I'm not the greatest Christian in the world or anything like that, but I have a respectable life. But I wasn't heavy at all. I can't even imagine the depths of depravity I would be in. The messed up life I would have if it wasn't for him. If I didn't come to Jesus Christ and ask him to save me, and give me eternal life. If I did not give him complete control of my life after I got saved, I can't even imagine where I would be. And he has taken my life and set me up upon a rock. He's exalted my life. He's lifted up my life. He's given me a life of dignity that I wasn't ha headed for at all. There's verses, uh, Daniel 12, 3, Luke 19, 17, Revelation 3, 21, Revelation 5, 10, Revelation 11, 12. Then he says, in verse 10, and this is what I want to finish with, what I started with. In verse 10, he says, I'll make you perfect. I'll complete you thoroughly by repairing and adjusting your life. Wow, what a promise. If I will just do what he tells me to do, God says, I'm going to keep working on you and, and making repairs and adjusting your life. Now, I'll tell you what, even you give yourself, give yourself completely to God. One of the things that you're going to go through as you, as you live that surrendered life is God's going to point out, you need to adjust this. This needs to be fixed in your life. And God's going to do it. 
God's going to affix me and repair me and adjust me as the need arises, as he shows me what needs to be taken care of there. He's going to perfect me. And can I tell you, the road to perfection, it, it can be, it can hurt a little bit. Boy, it feels good once it's fixed. That's right. It feels real good once it's fixed. And I look, you can probably give this testimony too. I look back on some of the things I used to do before I got saved. And when God fixed it, oh, it sure feels good. I'm not doing that anymore. He says, I, I will establish you, 1 Peter 5.10. I'll set fast or turn you resolutely in a certain direction. You see, I will give your life <coughs> some stability to it. You'll be, I'll turn your direction. Here's the way. Here's the way. Walk you in. Keep your face set like a flint down this path. I'm going to give you a way to go. I feel sorry for you Christians that are, are, are so wishy-washy. One day you're walking the straight path, next day you're over here, next day you're over here. I feel sorry for you. When God says, I want to set your feet on this path and have you walk it, I want to establish you. Then he says, I'll strengthen you. If you'll do what I tell you to do, I'll strengthen you. I'll confirm you in spiritual knowledge and, and in power. I'll strengthen you. I'll give you the spiritual strength you need and the power you need to get to do the things you need to do and to quit doing the things you need to quit doing. Then he says, I'll settle you. Something put down, a foundation laid, a basis <coughs> for it. He says, I'll, I'll settle you. You won't be wishy-washy anymore. You won't be up and down. You won't be unfaithful. You'll become a Christian who is stable and solid in their Christian walk. By the way, go to Philippians 1.6. And the last verse I'll share with you, Philippians 1, 6. This is the work that God said he would do in us. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Boy, I'll tell you, can you imagine what kind of life that is? He's working in my life. He's working in my life. He says, you know what I want to do for you? I want to show you my care. I want to give you a, a crown of glory. He said, I want to give grace to you. I want to exalt you. I want to perfect you. I want to establish you. I want to strengthen you. I want to settle you. What a difference from the day you met Jesus to that kind of life. And boy, if you take think about that. Here you are today, and you think about the rest of your life. If God keeps will do all that in the rest of your life, how will it be for you 10 years from now? 20 years from now, 30 years from now, pretty good. Man, pretty good. You know what that means? That means your, 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 your marriage will be even stronger. You know what that means? That means your family will be even stronger. You know what that means? There will be even more blessings, more victories in your life. God will use you even more. And you'll be more ready to meet him than you are today. You see, there's nothing but good stuff there. See, it does work. If we work the Christian life, then the Christian life will work for us. God will make sure it works. But I want to ask you this morning, are you working at it? Are you working at the Christian life? <clears throat> yeah, you don't work to get saved. You don't do that all. Work's got nothing to do with salvation. But as far as the Christian life working, you have to work at it. You can't just say, well, I'm a Christian now, so my life's going to be great from now on. No, no, not at all. If you take, if you take what God tells you to do and you do it, it will. Right. You see, you got to work at it. It's a commitment of your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Luke 6, 46 says, Jesus asked the question, he said, why do you call me Lord and do not the things that I say? Preach. When you commit yourself, commit your life to the Lordship of Jesus, that means he is Lord, he is master of your life. When you do that, God begins to work these things that we mentioned into your life. Then the Christian life is all God promised that it would be. If yours is not <clears throat> that way, it's because you're not working at it. And you're not being what you should be. It's not because God is not being what he should be, because God is what he should be. That's right. Boy, he's got a great life he wants you to have. I mean, just those four words. Perfect. <clears throat> established. Strengthened. Settled. Totally opposite of this chaotic world that we live in totally opposite of so many of the people that we meet when we're out door knocking or out, out just at work. 
It's totally opposite. That's the kind of life I want. And that's the kind of life God offers us. He says, I'll give it to you. If you'll do what I say, if you'll work at the Christian life, then I'll work these things into your life. And you'll see what an awesome life you can have. It starts with salvation. All starts with salvation. Everything God has for you starts with salvation. you got to be saved. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, this stuff isn't for you. Until you get saved, then all of it's for you. You can have all. See, to be saved means to be rescued from hell. Rescued from hell. Yeah, you need to be rescued from hell. You know why? Because that's where you're headed. You know why you're headed there? Because you're a sinner. You broke God's law. So did I. We all have. You broke God's law. And you break man's law, the penalty is you got to go to jail. When you break God's law, the penalty is you have to pay for it with death. In the Bible, there's two deaths. There's a physical death, which puts you in the grave, separates you from your family. But there's also the second death, and that's separation from God in the lake of fire forever. But God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. And God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus Christ left heaven, came to earth. He was born in this manger as this cute little baby. But he grew up, lived a perfect life. He became a man, and he did what he came here to do, and that was to go to the cross. And on that cross, God the Father placed all of your sins, past, present, and future, on him and punished him for your sins. He paid the penalty that you'd have to pay if you died and went to hell. Jesus did that for you because he loves you. Same time, he bought you the gift of eternal life. So you can go to heaven. It's a gift. You don't earn your way into heaven. It's a gift from God purchased by Jesus. He paid the price for that gift. To prove he was God, they, and what he said was for real and true, he took, they took him off the cross. They laid him in a tomb, but three days later, he walked out of that tomb alive. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. <clears throat> and the Bible says if you'll call on him and ask him to be your Savior, to save you from hell and give you eternal life, God says you shall be saved. If you never do that, you shall not be saved. If you're not, if you die and you're not saved, you go to hell. You go to a place God does not want you to go. He didn't make hell for you. He made hell for the devil and his angels. You'll go there over the cross of Christ, over the love of Christ. He doesn't want you to go there. He wants you in heaven because he loves you. So if you don't know for sure you're going, you can know that today. We can take the Bible and we'll do it in a way we won't embarrass you at all. You just leave your seat, come up front here during the time we, we have what we call an invitation song. You walk up here, you say, Pat, a preacher, Brother Kevin will be here. You tell Brother Kevin, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. We'll have somebody take the Bible and show you God's plan of salvation, not the Baptist plan. God's plan of salvation. We just happen to believe it. It's God's plan of salvation. And you can see clearly I can have eternal life. I can go to heaven when I die. God loves me. He wants me in heaven. I can have my sins paid for and forgiven. If you come to Jesus this morning, take care of it. If you're a Christian this morning, <clears throat> why don't you decide this morning that you're going to submit yourself to the Lord. You're going to submit yourself <clears throat> to the spiritual authorities in your life. You're going to submit yourself to others and be a servant. You're going to humble yourself. You're going to cast all your care on him. You're going to be serious about your Christian life. You're going to be watchful, watching, watching out for Satan's attempts to try to pull you down. And you're going to resist Satan steadfastly in your life. And then God can give you all the things he wants to give you. And you'll see a Christian life really works. And the Christian life is easy, and the Christian life is fun. There's nothing like it in all the world. It's the greatest life you could ever want to live. You can take all the Money, the rich lifestyle, you can have all that. The famous lifestyle, you can have all that. I'll take this simple life that God gave me Amen. any day. And you can have it too. Let's pray. Every hand and bow right close. Father, thank you for the Bible. Help us this morning to listen to the Holy Spirit as he's speaking to us and to look in our lives. <clears throat> Lord, there are people here maybe that don't know your son as their Savior. They need to take care of that today. They need to accept, come and accept Christ today. They need to tell, come and tell us they don't know for sure they're going to heaven. Not to, not to embarrass them at all, but so that we can take the Bible and show them from the Bible your plan of salvation. Lord, those that are saved, help them to make the next decision in their life. Maybe it's, maybe it's baptism. Maybe they need to get baptized. Maybe it's they need to join the church. Or maybe they just need to come and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work at the Christian life from now on. So I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going to submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life. I'm going to submit myself to my, the spiritual authorities God's brought in my life. I'm going to submit myself and be a servant to those that God brings in my life. 
I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to cast my care on him. I'm going to be serious about my Christian life. I'm going to watch for Satan's attempts to try to pull me down. I'm going to be on guard, and I'm going to resist him steadfastly. Help, the, help everybody here, Lord, to, to make that decision, those decisions this morning if they haven't made them already. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're not sure you're saved, it's time to take care of that. How many would say, preacher, I remember when somebody took the Bible and showed me from the Bible how I could be saved. They showed me God's plan of salvation, and I called on Jesus, and I asked him to be my Savior. And because I did that, I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. If that's you, you raise your hand. I know for sure I'm going to heaven when I die. 100% positive. That's great. You may lower your hands. How many would say, preacher, I want to go to heaven when I die, but I honestly am not sure. I know God loves me. I know God wants me in heaven, but I'm not sure I'd go. And I want to be honest about it, and I want to raise my hand and tell you that. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. I want to be sure, but I'm not sure. In just a moment, we'll have a song of invitation. We're going to stand. And it, when the song begins, I, I beg you, as one human being to another, if you're not sure you're saved, come up front here and tell Brother Kevin, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I want to be sure. I want to see from God's word how I can be sure heaven's going to be my home when I die. And somebody will take the Bible and show you God's amazing love for you and how, you, and how he saved you and offers you eternal life as a gift. If you are saved, the next step is baptism. If you haven't been baptized since you've been saved, you can do that today. God wants that. Not as a way of saving you or, or, or washing away your sins. It's a step of obedience to God. So you can show in a picture, in a symbol, what you did to get saved. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. How that saved you. That's what baptism is. But you need to be baptized as a step of obedience to the Lord. You can do that today. Come up and tell Brother Kevin, I'd like to be baptized. I've been saved, but I've not been baptized <coughs> uh, uh, since I've been saved. And remember... The Bible commands you to do that. If you are saved and baptized, you're not a member of the church, come up and tell Brother Kevin I'd like to join the soul-winning church here and be a part of this ministry as we try to reach the world with the gospel. Christian, if God spoke to your heart about your Christian life, about your life, I mean, are you living a full Christian life? Do you have all, are you getting all that God wants to give you? Is God your life, all of your life? Or is he just part of it? Make him all of it today. Decide you're going to do the things that God says to do, <clears throat> as we talked about this morning, so that God can give you a crown of glory, can pour his grace into your life, can exalt you, put you give you a life of dignity. He can perfect you. He can establish you. He can strengthen you. He can settle you. Come and tell God, I want that kind of life, and I'll do what God says to do. I need to do to get that. Let's all stand. Heads, bowed, eyes closed. You obey the Holy Spirit as the song begins.